All right, welcome back to our study in the book of 1 Peter. This is lesson six as you're following along. <clears throat> so the goal is to go through the book of, the, of 1 Peter verse by verse and, and find out how these scriptures look at that in context way back in Peter's day, have application and meaning in our lives here in today, which if you're watching this as they're being recorded in 2024. So we are picking up right where we left off in 1 Peter chapter 3, or sorry, chapter 1, verse 3. And we're going to start moving. We're laying a good foundation. And after the foundation is laid, it'll be easier to move through the rest of the chapter and make sense of it. So um, it talked about Peter started out by talking about um, certain things that we were, we were chosen by God and foreknown by God. Remember that? Before we ever did anything right or wrong, He already knew everything we would do and still chose us. That is comforting to me. Uh, I hope that's comforting to you as well. So looking at that, um, He picked, he picked us after, uh, after He knew us, and then after he chose us and we respond to that call of God to become a Christian, he starts the process of growing us. <clears throat> and we went through verse 1 and 2, and we're picking up in 3 from there with those understandings. So verse 3 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with Great expectation. Um, now, I do want to say, if you hear my voice getting higher, I just got over <clears throat> a cold, which turned into a respiratory infection. I'm antibiotics is working; it's it's magic, and prayers are working their magic. But I'm in that transit transition time, so just bear with me on the voice there. But talks about uh, talking about being born again. So we all know uh, birth is an exciting time. You uh, you first hear about someone and what do they say they're expecting you know we see the end of that verse says we live with great expectation we're there what does that mean when they're expecting they're expecting to have a child within a certain amount of time and that's birth comes there's people in the waiting room there's people around just waiting to hear the news um, a lot of times now a lot of the mystery's gone before you everybody used to wait until the child was born then you knew what you were having now most people know beforehand they'll even do those little parties those gender reveal parties and go through great lengths. Uh, those are fun to watch sometimes, but <clears throat> they get pretty creative. But it's because they're excited about what's coming. And when it comes to being born again, first of all, um, we hear the gospel and we get hope. Hope that we can actually have an answer to all these issues we've had in our lives realizing that we're lost without God, but that God didn't leave us without hope is, a, is an amazing blessing. And so then we get faith, and the Bible says that we're given a measure of faith by God. So we re, re respond to what God has given us faith to respond to, and we become born again. And after that, um, we are born again, and it's through His mercy. It's not anything we did to deserve it. God didn't look at us and He's like, oh, I got to have that one that because of this, this, and this. Because every, every one of us, whatever our gifts, talents, abilities, and characteristics we have, were given to us by God to fulfill what He's given us to fulfill as Christians. But uh, so we have birth and following our birth, we start to learn how to walk. You know, just like babies, we learn to take our first steps and we learn to walk just like we did physically, we learn to walk spiritually. And uh, so we continue that process of getting hope, looking at what God's already done, getting faith, hearing what God wants to do, responding in faith and seeing God do what we haven't seen Him do yet <coughs> in our lives and in the lives of others around us. So it says in, in there that we have hope. Um, we have this great expectation Um and now as we have our Christian walk, we, we, we go through periods of life where God, we get, we get pregnant with the promises of God 
and they grow until they give birth to what God wants to give birth to. Just like when we got saved, we listen to God, we respond to God, and we trust God and because we're powerless to do anything ourselves. And then God brings about what he wants to bring about through our obedience. Um, and he even gives us the strength for the obedience. It's all God. So we, as Christians, as soon as we become right with God, as soon as we become God's child, we have hope that the world doesn't have. The worst thing to do as far as feeling this hopelessness is go to the funeral of somebody who was not saved. Um, and Or to be around people at a funeral and those people are not saved. <clears throat> but I knew it's, it's one of those things where you, you say you can never judge whether someone's right with God or not. You never know if they might have done it last minute. But there are funerals I've walked in and there's just this deep foreboding and heaviness in my spirit and I just uh, if I'm basing things on that I would say they weren't they weren't ready to go and the people around there don't have a lot of hope they don't have any hope that they're going to see that person again but the different story is when you have a Christian and they've lived their life for God they pass away and they slip out of their body like a hand slips out of a glove and they're present with God now and we know as we are Christians, we'll get to see them again. This is not goodbye. This is I'll see you later. And so that brings a difference there. There's, there's a hopelessness in people's lives in that situation. Well, there's other situations too. What about someone who puts all their hope in their job, all their, all their hope in their positions, all their hope in money? And... It doesn't produce the things they thought, and they get to they get to accomplish all these things that they thought were the answer, and they come to a period of hopelessness because now they found out that it wasn't the answer. Christians have the true answer. They have hope where the world doesn't have hope. So um, here's the thing. With all these people who are looking for hope in the, all the wrong places, we are the ones who can give, give them hope when they have no hope anywhere else. Christians have their changed lives, and those changed lives are evidence of God's reality, and that can give them, give the lost hope. And we need to understand the power of a changed life, even when someone says, I don't believe in God, I think there are many paths to heaven, I don't care. They say that, but yet something inside of us, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that eternity is in our hearts. And there's something inside of us when we're not connected to God that when we encounter someone who is, it, it, it makes us realize that what we have isn't, isn't fulfilling us. And I will tell you this, if you are full of God's love, it says, the Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart, but then what's the process after that, and we'll talk more as we go through this book, but God wants to work that love out of us and through us to others so that they, when they encounter us, encounter God's love. And that love and that mercy and that kindness that's flowing out of us is going to draw them to God because it's His kindness that leads to repentance. Okay, so that being said, uh, it goes to verse 4 here. Now, well, before we get to verse 4, let's talk about some things so we can be clear. There are three tenses of salvation that it talks about just in this, in this uh, short set of verses. Um, we have past. Well, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. What, when did that happen? When we gave our heart to God, when we responded to the gift that Jesus provided for us when he died on a cross and shed his blood. It cleanses us of our sins. Our old sin nature was crucified with Jesus on that cross. When he died, we died with him. When he was resurrected, we came to life as something new that had never existed before. We are now created in the likeness and image of God in a way that uh, our, our spirit is now alive. The part of us that is in contact with God, that can be in contact with God, is now in contact with God. And so that's where we have in the past. But we also have salvation and presence. Uh, we are presently being saved 
um, from the power of sin, but also there's a power keeping us go as we go through this life, um, preserving us and helping us stay in Christ until we get to our future salvation when we'll be saved from the presence of sin completely and we'll, and Jesus will be manifested back and we're now on the other side of eternity and we are with uh, the Lord in, pre- in His presence forever. So keep those in mind as we're going through these verses. So in 4 it says, And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of of change and decay. So now it's talking about it's talking about it went from our past salvation where we receive that salvation, right? Of that new birth. Now it's talking about our inheritance which is into the future. And that's talking about future salvation. But it's it's talking about it's pure and undefiled. It's unspotted from the world. It's beyond the reach of change and decay. Uh, I let Isaiah 35 talks about a highway of holiness, and if you stay on that highway, nothing defiled gets gets on there. Um, we are in a process of being changed to be more and more like Him, and in fact, we'll be talking about that um, not too many lessons down the road. But it's it's important to understand that we need to cooperate with where he's taken us and how he's taken us. But even so, we may have a hundred off ramps from that highway of holiness and, and step out and get, and get defiled out in our outer man. We are preserved for our inheritance and being preserved for sal- our ultimate salvation, no matter what, how many, how many times we have sinned and have to repent and, and reconnect with God. It may break our fellowship, but it doesn't change who we are. We're still his child. Just like if you have a child and they do something and you're like completely unhinged, mad about it, or you're disappointed or you're upset or you're sorrowful, nothing changes the fact that they are still your child. And so it's important to understand that we are God's children as Christians, and that nothing can separate us from that that and there are a lot of a lot of trap doors you can get into where people try to get into the argument of okay so now I can just say a prayer once and then live however I want well if you're doing that that's not really that's not salvation that's not a changed life coming back from uh to our previous conversation but we'll get more into that as we go along um but usually people who love God are changed by God. Um, they're, they're, they're forever ruined for the world. They're forever ruined for sin. Now, they may still practice it, but they're never again comfortable with it. When we were sinners, we practiced sin, and it was comfortable because it's our nature. Now we have a new nature, a changed nature. And we're going to pick up on this tomorrow. So... I will see you tomorrow in our study on the book of 1 Peter.